Hello, and welcome to the August 3rd Thursday program presented by the Hoover Presidential Foundation. I'm Jerry Flegel, President and CEO of the Foundation, and I'd like to start by thanking our partners in this program, the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library Museum, the Herbert Hoover National Historic Site, and the West Branch Public Library. This month, we're pleased to welcome viewers who have registered public libraries all across the state of Iowa. They include the Burlington, Cedar Falls, Council Bluffs, Davenport, Independence, Sioux Center, Spencer, Urbandale, and Waterloo Public Libraries, as well as the Carnegie Stout Library in Dubuque and the James Kennedy Public Library in Dyersville. Together, this group is expanding tonight's program all across Iowa, and we're so glad that you could join us this evening. When we began the third Thursday series last year, we'd begin each program with a short reception in the Hoover Presidential Library lobby, where guests could meet, enjoy light appetizers, and chat with the evening speaker. Well, COVID-19 put an end to that for the time being. So we found other ways to, br other ways to bring you quality programs like this one via the internet. I'd like to encourage you to regularly check your website and Facebook page as well as, the, as well as those of the library, historic site, and your favorite public library for special program offerings that will pop up in the months ahead. Now for some details. As you view tonight's webinar, we invite you to, answer, to enter questions through the Q&A feature you'll find along the edge of your screen. You may also vote for questions someone else has entered if you'd like to hear those answered. As we may not have time to answer all the questions provided, Top vote getters will be asked first. Now, with that, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Lawrence Cook. He will present an evening with the presidents and present little known facts and stories about presidents James Buchanan, Benjamin Harrison, Grover Cleveland, Theodore Roosevelt, Jimmy Carter, and of course, Herbert Hoover. Dr. Lawrence Cook is a nationally recognized presidential historian specializing in the personal side of the presidency. He is a lifelong collector of presidential memorabilia and has a museum quality collection which exceeds 8,000 pieces. He is the author of Presidential Coincidences, Amazing Facts, and Collectibles, and has a new book coming out this fall entitled Symbols of Patriotism, Patriotism First Ladies and Daughters of the American Revolution. He has lectured at numerous events in historic places, including C-SPAN, History TV, and US News and World Report. And recently, he was appointed to the Board of Directors for the future National First Families Library and Museum in Marshfield, Missouri. Dr. Cook, thank you for being here tonight as our very special guest. Thank you, Jerry, for that nice introduction. It's an honor to be here. Um, and it's an honor to uh, be invited to share some of my stories and uh, some items from my collection. So we have a lot to cover tonight with these six fascinating presidents that I want to talk about. And um, I'm just going to uh, thank the audience for, for uh, signing in tonight to watch me. I understand that we have a rather large audience. And uh, you're going to see me move around a little bit to pick up some of this memorabilia so I can show it to you. So. I'll ask you to excuse me if I'm moving around a little bit, but um, we, we want to get you a, a good look at, uh, at some of the memorabilia that I have here. It's, uh, it's a little, uh, with 8,000 pieces, it's a little much to uh, think about what I want to bring to my presentations. Um, so you, can, you, you get to see more than some of the people at my live presentations because you can see some of the things on the walls and stuff in back of me. I actually have a two-room office where I have most of my uh, memorabilia displayed, so you get to see a little bit more than even what we're going to show you close up tonight. But uh, the, the first president that I'd like to talk about tonight is James Buchanan. And I like to talk about James Buchanan because uh, he's one that, frankly, you really don't hear very much about. Uh, he's kind of in the shadow of uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, Buchanan was the 15th president, of course, Lincoln the 16th president. And uh, so you don't hear too much about him. And I have a couple of stories about him that uh, I find that when I tell them, not too many people have, have heard about them. Uh, first of all, he's uh, the only president from Pennsylvania. 
uh, and for those of you who don't know, I'm in Pennsylvania uh, now. This is where I live, northeastern Pennsylvania, Dallas, Pennsylvania. So he's the only president from Pennsylvania, and he's the only president that was never married. Uh, a lot of people refer to it as being our only bachelor president, but that's really not totally accurate because Grover Cleveland, who we're going to talk about after James Buchanan, was a uh, bachelor president until he got married in the White House. But uh, James Buchanan never did get married. First of all, uh, I want to show you one piece of memorabilia I have here. And this is an original uh, signature of James Buchanan. It's a clipped signature. And that, uh, that's a no-no for uh, collectors, uh, but that was something that they used to do back in the uh, late 19th century and the early 20th century. They would actually clip out a signature from an envelope or from a, uh, uh, a document or a letter and throw the rest away and save the signature. So you kind of are happy as a collector when you find a signature that's clipped because you found the signature, but you're also kind of... Uh, dismayed because some history got thrown out there some sometime. If you notice on this one, uh, it does say free above it. I, I framed it in with this etching of President Buchanan, and it says free in, above his name. And what that means is that all uh, presidents and first ladies get free postage. So back, uh, particularly before the printing was large scale, the president or the first lady was sending out a letter would write free above their name on the envelope. So if you're a collector and you happen to get an envelope with a document or a letter inside, you're kind of really getting a, a bonus because you really get their autograph twice. So this one was clipped from, a, from an envelope. Um, and you can't see it a real lot here with, with Buchanan, but the first story that I want to talk about with him has to do with his physical appearance. And you can notice it a little bit, but it's really evident on a photograph of him or uh, other renditions of him, that he has a real noticeable head tilt, uh, tilting to the left. And a lot of people uh, believe, believed and still do believe when they see that, that he suffered from a condition called wry neck, which is a, uh, a chronic spasm of the neck muscles. But actually, he did not suffer from wry neck. Um, what he had was a very rare eye condition where he had, uh, he, farsightedness in one eye and nearsightedness in the other eye. This is something he was born with. And to make matters a little worse for him, uh, just an anomaly in his anatomy uh, where his left eye socket was positioned higher in the skull than the right eye socket. So he just had this position as a compensatory uh, mechanism for his condition. Probably didn't really even realize that, that he was doing it. He probably started having that posture as a, a child um, and just just grew up with that. But uh, you'll, you'll take notice now that I told you about it. If you see pictures of President Buchanan, his head is noticeably uh, tilted to the left. And remarkably, he never wore glasses until like the last, I believe, two or three years uh, in his life. So he just always compensated uh, for that condition with his with his posture. The other story that I like to talk about with President Buchanan is the fact that he was never married, as I mentioned early on. And uh, there's been a lot of speculation throughout the years as to why he was never married. And um, I, I really think I have the story that, that really explains probably why he was never married. When he was a young man, he was an up-and-coming attorney in the Lancaster, Pennsylvania area where he lived. And he had fallen in love with a girl by the name of Ann Coleman. And Ann happened to be from one of the wealthiest families in Pennsylvania, uh, and certainly one of the wealthiest in the Lancaster area. And uh, Ann Coleman's parents were quite against the, uh, the relationship between uh, James and her, as, as a lot of parents are. And um, James had to do some work for a, a client in the Lancaster area, and it necessitated him to have to go to Pennsylvania, or go to, excuse me, uh, Philadelphia for an extended period of time. And when he left for Philadelphia, Mrs. Coleman kind of saw the chance to put a wedge there in the relationship uh, with uh, her daughter and James. And so she was 
known to say things to like, you know, while well, he's off in the big city and you don't know what he's doing there. And also he hasn't written to you. And it was true that she had not gotten any letters from him, but it was not true that he had not written to her. He had actually written to her, but whatever happened to the letters, uh, who knows, they didn't get to her. There's speculation that maybe Mrs. Coleman uh, intercepted the letters, uh, but that's not really known. But the bottom line is, is that Anne did not get any letters from him. And when he returned from uh, Philadelphia back to the Lancaster area, the day he returned, he had to immediately go to his client's house to uh, give a report on the work that he had done for the client in Philadelphia. And this is where the, uh, the setup for a perfect storm of tragedy uh, starts. Because when he got to his client's house, the client's niece had been visiting that day. And the niece happened to be uh, a girl that uh, knew James, liked James, they had went out a couple of times in the past. And so she kind of saw her opportunity to, uh, to also put a wedge in the relationship. And she sent word over to Anne's house that uh, James had actually stopped to see her uh, on his long term, uh, on getting back from his long term trip to Philadelphia, rather than come right over to the Coleman's and see uh, his, his fiance. And, um, and again, that wasn't true. He had stopped there on business and she just happened to, to be there. So James didn't know this when he left there and went to the Coleman house and knocked on the door. He was greeted there by a servant who would not let him in. And he was turned away and not allowed to come in. So I can just imagine his, his thought process at that time. He was probably totally just wondering why he, he couldn't, you know, be let in, whether it was explained to him or not, I don't know. Uh, but he was turned away and uh, Anne was very distraught over the whole thing and decided that she would go to Philadelphia the next day and spend some time with her sister and brother-in-law. And when she went there, sometime during her stay there, she overdosed on laudanum, which was a, uh, a fairly popular drug at the time. And, uh, and, and actually died from a laudanum overdose. And uh, James tried very much to contact the family and pleaded to go to her funeral. And the family would not allow him to go to the funeral. Uh, so as tragic as this is, it probably set the course for James uh, being president of the United States because um, Lancaster, like a lot of towns back then, and even a lot of towns today, small town, a lot of gossip. And of course, gossip got around about that and, and nobody knew the, the real story and people kind of, you know, were looking sideways at James uh, for a while. Uh, but that, that subsided when, uh, when the, the parents, the Coleman parents, actually did a similar thing to uh, one of the, their other daughters, and it ended up in tragedy as well, and, and she too overdosed. So after that, James kind of, uh, you know, people looked differently at him and knew that it probably wasn't his fault. But when I mentioned it changed history, is he was so depressed over uh, the loss of his fiance that a lot of his friends uh, decided to uh, convince him to run for Congress. And they figured that would be a good thing because then he would get out of Lancaster and uh, not only be busy as a politician, but would get out of Lancaster and be able to take his mind off of it. So uh, that's a story that you don't hear very often, uh, but I think it really uh, sets up an explanation as to why James Buchanan probably never, uh, never got married. The next president that we're going to talk about is uh, Grover Cleveland, and I have uh, a cabinet card here, trying to get it where it doesn't glare too much, um, that this one here, and you can, I don't know if you can make it out or not, but it says S. Grover Cleveland on it. And uh, that's because Grover's real first name was Stephen. Stephen Grover Cleveland. He dropped the use of Stephen uh, early on, maybe in his late teens, uh, and just went by Grover Cleveland. But there are actually a lot of presidents, including uh, Gerald Ford, uh, 
uh, President Coolidge, uh, President Clinton, uh, Ulysses Grant, that all have uh, names different than their birth names. But uh, Grover Cleveland certainly is one. His birth name was Stephen. And on here we have uh, also a, a campaign ribbon uh, on the other side that you can see, which is really quite nice and, and colorful and it's maintained its colors for uh, over 100 years. So uh, Grover Cleveland is another one of my favorite presidents to talk about. And I tend to say that about all the presidents because I love talking about all of them. So uh, the one I'm talking about at the moment, I'll, I'll tend to say that's, that's one of my favorites. But there's a lot to talk about with, with Grover Cleveland. Um, I do have a bone to pick with him a little bit because he forever messed up the presidential numbering system. As many of you probably know, he was our 22nd and 24th president the only president to have served two non-consecutive terms. Uh, and in the middle was Benjamin Harrison, who was coming up next. And um, so he's taken the number 22 and 24 spot. So it's kind of messed up the presidential numbering system uh, for history. But um, he, as a young man, uh, went from New Jersey to with a, a friend and was planning on going to uh, Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, probably because there was probably a, a draw there for the name, of course, uh, as to why they were going there. But he had to pass through Buffalo. And on passing through Buffalo, he stopped to see a, a successful uncle, a successful businessman who was his uncle, uh, on his way there. And his uncle convinced him to uh, stay in Buffalo and try to make a go of it there. And I love these little things uh, that, and you'll hear me say that a few times, that just change history, things that nobody would give a second thought about, and they changed American history. So with his uncle convincing him to stay there, uh, Grover really just excelled in, in Buffalo, New York. And he held various positions there, and one of them including being the uh, sheriff of Erie County. And that gives him kind of the macabre distinction of being the only president to uh, act as an executioner. As sheriff of Erie County, he had to pull the gallows on two, two different men that were uh, convicted, of, uh, convicted of murder and sentenced to hang. And he could have put this off uh, and to an underling, uh, but he, he felt that he you know, shouldn't give that responsibility to anybody else. It was in his job description and that, that he should do it. So he was the sheriff of, of Erie County and uh, very much so uh, fulfilled all of, all of his duties there. He did, however, pay for someone to serve in the Civil War for him. And that was completely legal at that time. Uh, and uh, he did that. And so he did not serve in the Civil War. He paid, paid someone to, to serve for him. And both of those issues, him being an, the executioner and him paying somebody to serve uh, in the Civil War for him, kind of came back to bite him a little bit uh, when he did run for president, as, as you could guess, because uh, uh, for years, and it still happens, anything negative that can be brought up during the presidential election will be. So those things were brought up uh, about him. Uh, but he overcame that and, and ended up winning the presidency uh, twice. Now, he, um, his wife, Frances, uh, another interesting story on how he met her. He actually knew Frances from the day she was born. Uh, Frances' father was a, a law partner and close, close friend of Grover Cleveland's. And as a matter of fact, when Frances was born, uh, Grover bought a, uh, a baby carriage or a baby buggy as a, uh, a gift for uh, the Folsom's uh, from the birth of their daughter. And um, so there was a really big age difference in, in between the two. Uh, and Francis's father was killed in a, a carriage accident and Grover uh, took over the responsibility for making sure that Francis and her mother both had uh, everything that they needed uh, after, after uh, Mr. Folsom had died. So, um, it was kind of funny because when Grover was president, as I mentioned, he was a bachelor at the time he went into the White House. 
And of course, there were all kinds of speculation out there for would this bachelor president ever marry? Uh, if he did, who would he marry? And the, the biggest rumor was uh, Francis's mother. Everybody thought that uh, he would end up getting married to Francis's mother, and no one knew that that him and now an adult uh, uh, Francis was uh, were having a uh, relationship which was pretty much all through correspondence. Um, he even uh, proposed to her through correspondence, and he went to Francis's mother to make sure that she was okay with him getting married and she was totally on board with it. So they kind of held it secret until just uh, before the wedding, and they made them an announcement, not knowing how the public would really view that. Uh, they had the White House uh, wedding, and the public uh, viewed it very, very favorably. It was very favor favorably viewed by the public. Um, she was a very popular first lady. And at the time of their marriage, he was 49 and she was 21, making her the youngest first lady in, in history. And I, every time I say that, it just amazes me to think about a 21-year-old woman coming in to the White House and being first lady with that awesome responsibility of, the, of that job. Uh, marrying Francis, again, a little uh, thing that can change history. Marrying Francis um, probably saved the president's life. Uh, he developed a lesion inside of his mouth, and he mentioned it to Francis. And she immediately called the White House doctor and wanted it looked at. And uh, I'm, I'm just amazed at the diagnostic skills of the old time doctors because the doctor looked at it, immediately called in a specialist, and they both agreed that it was cancerous. Um, and Grover is known for being one of the most honest presidents in American history, but he also orchestrated one of the biggest cover ups in American history in that he demanded that his operation for the removal of this tumor in his mouth. Uh, be kept totally, totally, totally under wraps. So they uh, came up with this plan to uh, get a person that Grover knew that had a big yacht, go out onto the East River. Uh, they got a, assembled a, a team of doctors, I believe four doctors, if I'm not mistaken, together, swarmed them to secrecy, and went out on the East River. They strapped a chair down into the, the galley to the to the main post, they strapped uh, big old Grover in the, into the chair and they gave him ether and proceeded to uh, remove the tumor, which was more extensive than they had even thought. And they ended up having to remove quite a uh, bit of his large palate, or I mean, I'm sorry, of his uh, hard palate. Uh, they had to remove uh, some of the soft palate. They had to remove several teeth. Uh, and it was quite a, uh, Quite an ordeal, and if any of you out there that are in the audience uh, have any medical training, you know how uh, how dangerous an operation like that could be because it's so vascular, of course, in your head and your mouth, and and the risk for bleeding. And not only that, they, they put him under with ether. Uh, Grover was a big guy, and uh, that that really uh, was was quite a risk. They even had a a, a doctor who was an expert in prosthetics. To make a rubber prosthesis to put in his mouth uh, right right then uh, right after the surgery, and they um, they stayed out on the East River, and the, of course the news reporters started to get a little uh, a little uh, asking questions about because they hadn't seen the president in a couple of days, and um, I thought this was pretty clever because uh, Grover was quite a fisherman, so they put Grover out on a on a fishing boat. Uh, way out into the river so that the reporters could see him, but of course they couldn't ask him any questions. So I thought that was uh, that was pretty neat. Uh, eventually, a reporter did find out about it, uh, but uh, no one really no one really believed the story. Uh, one of the doctors talked, uh, and uh, nobody really believed the the story for years. Uh, but it was quite remarkable. Uh, the tumor is in the uh, the Mummers Museum in Philadelphia. They have the, the tumor located there. Uh, I want to show you a couple of other uh, Grover Cleveland items. 
uh, this is a, uh, a rare broadside uh, for when he was running for governor. Um, I don't think I mentioned it before, but while he was in Buffalo, he went from the mayor of Buffalo to the governor of New York State to the president of the United States in a remarkable three and a half years. So he was just really a, a go-getter in Buffalo along with the other uh, positions he had prior to, to politics. So this is the only one I've ever seen, uh, this, this broadside for governor of uh, Grover Cleveland in Buffalo uh, for New York State. Um, the other item I have here is a, uh, a picture of Frances Cleveland and then an autograph of her uh, yours very truly. It was obviously attached to something or may have even been clipped off of something. Uh, and that's her, her autograph as First Lady in, uh, on May 19th, or May 13th, uh, 93. So um, Grover's a, an interesting guy. One more little, one more little fact on Grover that I, I wanted to mention. When uh, Franklin Roosevelt was five years old, he went to the White House with his father. His father was uh, invited to meet with President Cleveland. And um, reportedly, uh, President Cleveland said to little five-year-old Grover something on the effect of my wish for you is that you will never become president of the United States. And uh, when I was getting ready for this presentation, I had to chuckle because uh, I had to think uh, probably President Hoover had that same wish uh, in 1932. Uh, he probably wished that Franklin Roosevelt would not become president of the United States. Um, the next person, the uh, next president that we're going to talk about is uh, Benjamin Harrison. And uh, before we start to talk about him, we got to say happy birthday to him because today is Benjamin Harrison's birthday. He was born on this date in 1833. Um, he, of course, is the only president to uh, be a grandson of another president, uh, William Henry Harrison. And uh, I'll show you Another cabinet card here of Benjamin Harrison, and this one he's uh, with his running mate, uh, Levi uh, Morton. And when he, as I had mentioned before, he challenged Grover Cleveland for re-election and won the election. And when they were leaving, when the Clevelands were leaving, Francis told the staff, uh, try to leave everything there as much as you can uh, the way we had it, and the staff said, why? And she said, because we're going to be back in four years. And she was, she was correct on that. Um, when the Harrisons came into the White House, uh, Caroline Harrison, Benjamin Harrison's wife and, and First Lady, wanted to do some major renovations in the White House, and it was very much needed. And so she secured some money uh, to do extensive renovations within the White House, not as much as she wanted. Um, she actually wanted to expand the White House and do that type of thing, but um, she got enough money to do uh, quite a few things, painting, uh, uh, remodeling of sorts, uh, new furnishings, and also they installed electricity into the White House for the first time. And both she and the president were scared to death of the electricity and would not touch the light switches. Uh, they waited, uh, would leave the, leave the lights on all night long and would wait for someone to come in in the morning to shut the lights off. Uh, they, would not, they would not touch the light switches. And um, Caroline Harrison uh, hired her niece, or, or I don't know if she, she didn't officially hire her, but had her niece come in, Mary Dimmick, to help her with her first lady duties. And um, after his four year term, after Benjamin Harrison's four year term, he ran for reelection, but as you know, he was challenged by Grover Cleveland. And a month before uh, the election, Caroline Harrison died in the White House. And um, so that had to be a really tough time for Benjamin Harrison. He's a month away from from trying to get reelected, and his wife passes away in the White House. Uh, her, her niece, uh, you know, took over the duties, of course, uh, for that time, for the rest of the time that they were in there. And a few years after leaving the White House, 
Benjamin Harrison ended up marrying Mary Dimmock, Caroline's niece. Uh, that caused a big to-do in the family. The family, Harrison's family, uh, and his then-grown children were not happy about it. But uh, nevertheless, uh, that's what happened, and, and that was his second wife. Um, Teddy Roosevelt. Teddy Roosevelt seems to be a, a, a favorite that everyone wants to, to hear about. Um, and uh, he, his greatness was, was really rooted in, in tragedy. Uh, in 1884, his mother and his wife both died on the same day. And this sent Teddy into a tailspin. Uh, and he had a newborn baby daughter, Alice, who he left with his relatives, and he went out west. Uh, and, and I'm sure most of you listening out there have heard about his uh, adventures out west, and he had several out there. Um, but he had said himself that if he hadn't had that experience out west, you know, he probably would have become president of the United States. And um, he, uh, as I mentioned, his, his daughter, Alice, uh, was left with the relatives. But as she got older, she was quite the, quite the character and really did kind of uh, most everything that uh, a young girl was not supposed to do back then um, as far as speaking out and, and, uh, and being kind of wild for the times. Uh, Teddy was known to say that I can either be president of the United States or I can uh, be a father to Alice. I can't do both. And Alice, in turn, would say, my father wants to be the baby at every christening, the bride at every wedding and the corpse at every funeral. So they would kind of banter back and forth there with that. Uh, but uh, Teddy, when he came back from his adventures out west, he was uh, very active in things and, and held various positions. But one of them was police commissioner in New York City. And so what I have here is a really uh, a neat possession that I, uh, I really think a lot of. And it's a a police commissioner certification signed by Teddy Roosevelt. He was only police commissioner, I believe, for about a year and a half. I don't think it was even two years. Um, so I have not seen another one of these. I know there are probably other ones out there somewhere, uh, but this is pretty nice, uh, this, this uh, patrolman being certified and Teddy signing his certification. Um, and he really did a lot to clean up the New York City Police Department. Uh, he would go out, go into uh, bars and other places where he would find patrolmen that were supposed to be on duty. And um, he really uh, laid down the law there and cleaned up the, uh, the, the police department. Now, um, Teddy was the youngest man to become president. Uh, I always kid with my audience and say, if you're ever on Jeopardy, read the question carefully because uh, he was the youngest president to become, or the youngest man to become president at age 42. Now, John F. Kennedy was the youngest man to be elected to the presidency, uh, but again, the elected is the operative word there. Of course, Teddy Roosevelt came in when, um, on, the, uh, on the event of the assassination of William McKinley when Teddy was, was vice president. Of course, Teddy's famous for his uh, time in the Rough Riders, and I'm sorry, I have to stand up, get this item here. But I have a, uh, a very rare celluloid cover Victorian photo album uh, with Teddy Roosevelt on the front, a uh, very handsome image of him in his Rough Rider uniform. And uh, it is a, a regular Victorian photo album that belonged to some family. None of the photos in there have anything to do with Teddy Roosevelt, but he was put on here as a, as a war hero. And, um, and it's just a wonderful, rare piece. Celluloid is an early type of plastic, so a lot of that stuff didn't survive when it got put in attics and basements and, and things like that. Um, I also have here that I thought would interest people would be an absentee ballot saying uh, mail-in voting and absentee ballots are all in the news right now. 
But this is a, an official war ballot uh, when Theodore Roosevelt was running for governor of New York State. And again, it's, it's pretty neat to have one of these that survived all these years. And I'm trying to get it close enough and hold it still where you can actually see at the top for governor Theodore Roosevelt. And on the back of this, uh, there were instructions for uh, filling it out and, 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 and filling it out. Uh, it has been and uh, how to mail it in and, and that type of thing. But I thought that this would be an interesting piece to show, seeing we have so much in the news right now about mail-in and uh, absentee ballots. Now, one story about, uh, and again, Teddy has a million stories out there. We could talk all night about each one of these presidents. But um, one story that I find that most people don't know about is in 1902, Teddy was very nearly killed in a carriage accident. And I have an original photo, I actually have three different original photos of Teddy Roosevelt's carriage accident in 1902. And that's the carriage that he was riding in. As you can see, it's, it's uh, pretty banged up. And what happened is he was in uh, Massachusetts at an event. I actually have a very small picture of him prior to this accident, also um, in, the, in the parade going down the street or the procession. And um, no one's really sure exactly what happened, but uh, after he left uh, that area of Massachusetts and was on to his next stop, uh, there's the trolley car, there was a trolley car with people that were anxious to catch a glimpse of the president. Um, there's some word that maybe they bribed the driver, or they just encouraged him to speed, but he sped any, at any rate, and his fate would have it, um, instead of catching up with the president's carriage, uh, the trolley car actually collided with the president's carriage. Now, keep in mind, this was in September of 1902. Teddy came into the White House in September of 1901 on the assassination of William McKinley. So, you know, we lost one president, and uh, almost exactly a year later, we very nearly lost uh, another president. It did very sadly kill a man by the name of Bill Craig, who was a Secret Service agent assigned to uh, Teddy Roosevelt. And that gives Bill Craig the distinction of being the first United States Secret Service agent to be killed in the line of duty. And this was very, very distressing for uh, President Roosevelt because Craig was a close personal friend of his. Uh, his kids, Teddy's kids, loved Bill Craig. Uh, and um, so it was very, very sad for the president. The president came very close to losing his life. Um, he was just banged up in the accident with the exception of a very bad leg wound. Um, so this accident could have easily gotten uh, President Roosevelt in two ways. He could have been killed from the crash or he could have been killed with the infection that developed later on in his leg. And he ended up having to go to a hospital, I believe it was in Indianapolis, Indiana, where he went to a hospital. Keep in mind, this was before antibiotics. And so they did everything they could for the leg injury um, in treating it and fortunately did treat it. But he was actually in a wheelchair for a few weeks. Uh, that's how bad that, that was. Um, so I uh, was very, very fortunate that uh, he was not killed in that accident, was very sad that Bill Craig was killed in the accident. Uh, the other two uh, passengers in the carriage that got uh, minor to moderate injuries, concussions, things like that, was George Cordelou, uh, the secretary to the president, and uh, the governor of Massachusetts. So um, the next president, that we uh, that we have to talk about is of course uh, the favorite for tonight, Herbert Hoover. Um, you can see in back of me. I think you all can see it. Um, I have a, a a poster in back of me. It says um, this this home is for Hoover because Hoover is for this home. And I'll see if I can hold that up. I don't know if it's going to be a little large to see it, but um, I love this. I found this poster at a at a flea market. Um, it was actually in a couple of different pieces, and I got it, and I uh, was able to piece it all nicely back together, 
and uh, and frame it to to preserve it because I just think it's just really a good looking poster that's uh, got an all American feel to it. And um, so I was very glad to be able to to save this, and very glad to uh, actually I'm going to put this back here because it makes a a great backdrop for this presentation. And um, now Herbert Hoover, at, at two years old, he developed croup very, very badly um, and was so sick from the croup that actually his parents uh, thought that he had died. And they even uh, put coins over his eyes, which was, sounds a little bizarre, but that was uh, kind of the thing to do uh, back then. And uh, fortunately, his uncle uh, came to the house, who was a physician, and revived him. So uh, again, I said I would say it a bunch of times, but again, these uh, things that change American history forever that nobody would, would really think of at, at the time. Um, he was orphaned by the time he was nine years old. His father died when he was very, very young, and then his mother died when I believe he was nine years old. And I just think it's remarkable for the accomplishments that Herbert Hoover made uh, with, with really being an orphan at, at nine years old and, and starting out life so, with so much difficulty. One of my favorite stories uh, to tell um, is, involves Herbert Hoover. And I've got a, a, a place that has me come every other month to, uh, to talk. And so I've spoken there several times. And uh, when I was there the last time, uh, they asked me, one of the people there asked me, and they said, we, we weren't, didn't happen to be talking about Herbert Hoover at that time. But he said, could you tell me, could you tell the Herbert Hoover baseball story again? Because we enjoyed it so much. So that made me feel good because it's one of my favorite stories. But when Herbert Hoover was a junior at Stanford, he was uh, involved in, in sports, and he was the captain of the baseball team. And when one of the games, uh, it was either noticed by him or told to him that someone had inadvertently walked through the, uh, the gates without paying. So the young Herbert Hoover uh, chased the man down. And when he reached him, he discovered uh, the man was none other than former President Benjamin Harrison, who had been uh, asked to come to Stanford to uh, give some speeches. And the admission was 25 uh, cents. And uh, I believe uh, President Harrison uh, apologized and gave uh, Herbert Hoover uh, a dollar, uh, which was four times the amount that, that was needed. And I just love things like that. And you have to, you have to wonder, with, with Hoover being in awe at the time of meeting a, a former president, and I believe he even said something in his memoirs about that was his first uh, first meeting with greatness or something to that effect. Um, and you know, would he have ever ever thought that that he too would be president of the United States? Um, another thing that I have that I was excited to show on this presentation is um, some. Uh, books and photos from a lady named Rosalie Ashton. And those familiar with President Hoover may very well um, have heard her name. I know your director, Dr. Tom Schwartz, has written a couple of blogs on uh, Rosalie Ashton. And we don't have the time to get into it a lot now, but I would suggest to read those, those blogs. I, I happen to get a whole box of paperwork that belonged to uh, Rosalie Ashton. She was a young research assistant that was hired by, uh, by Herbert Hoover to do a movie uh, or a couple of movies on the famine relief. And to make a long story short, and you'll see this in, in, uh, in, in Dr. Schwartz's blogs if you read them, but the two movies that were made are lost to history. And so this was actually a working copy of other other things like this that belong to her. Um, and I, I'm thinking that's probably in her handwriting, but um, a very significant uh, amount of paperwork that uh, I have. And I wanted to share a couple of pictures here uh, that I'm thinking may never have been really publicly put out. I know one from this meeting was put out, um, excuse my fingers there, 
But these were in Rosalie's uh, files. And you see Herbert Hoover there in the, in the middle. And another something, and maybe some of these might be uh, unpublished photos. Here he is working, working at his desk. And then here he is with, with someone that I, I'm not sure um, who that is. President uh, Hoover and his wife both spoke uh, Chinese. And I find this very amusing that uh, at times they would uh, speak to each other in the White House in Chinese so that people around them uh, couldn't understand what they were saying. So I thought that was, I thought that was uh, pretty clever. And uh, a couple other quick things here. I don't, I don't want to run out of time, but a couple of things I did want to show you. Some of the things in my collection are, are the little things that have survived that I really like. This is a pencil eraser in the image of Herbert Hoover. And it's amazing that that's survived on this little worn down pencil. I have another pencil here. We kind of have a pencil theme going on, but an unused pencil that says, started here, Her Herbert Hoover for president. And as you can see, it was never sharpened, never, never used. We have two items here. This is a, an actually a sewing kit. You see these around once in a while. Um, and a thimble that says Hoover on it. So it actually says Hoover and Curtis. And so these were designed uh, very time appropriate because with the, with the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the uh, 19th Amendment the other day. And uh, so this would have just been well, like eight years later and um, so these were designed to uh, to attract the the, the uh, women's vote, and so I really I really like showing these for that reason the thimble and the in the sewing kit. In 2012, um, President Carter uh, surpassed President Hoover's record of being the longest uh, in retirement, the longest former president in retirement, and President Carter was actually very very uh, happy about that. Uh, I happened to have, was having lunch with him um, just a short time after that, and he couldn't wait to tell me because he knows uh, how much I, I like all these little, uh, these little unusual and unknown pieces of history. So as soon as we sat down for lunch that day back in 2012, he said, you know, I just, uh, I just broke uh, Herbert Hoover's record of uh, being the longest in, in retirement, and he was, he was very, very proud of that. So the, uh, the last person that, that uh, we're going to talk about tonight, the last president we're going to talk about, is, uh, is my friend, Jimmy Carter. Uh, I talk about him on a more of a personal level, really. Uh, we've been friends for 16 years, 16 plus years. Uh, and uh, him and uh, Rosalind are very much the reason why uh, I'm a... Uh, full-time historian and have the career in history that I have. Uh, I had done it for years and, um, and after getting to be friends with them and they saw a couple presentations that I did, uh, they, uh, President Carter, Rosalind, and my wife Diane all convinced me to uh, do this full-time. So I'm very, very proud to say that uh, former president of the United States and former first lady and my wife all convinced me to, uh, to become a full-time historian and it's the best job I've ever had. I just, I just love what I do and can't believe that this is my life. Uh, but um, President Carter, when you, when you get to know, when you know him and, and you know the people around him or you learn about the people around him, you realize that he, he's, all his life had the ability to see good in people and to see good in situations. And it's evident that he took that goodness from the people 
early on in his life that, that influenced him and incorporated those, those good qualities into his own uh, personality. And I'm going to name a few. There are others. But um, his mother is first and foremost uh, one. His mother was a, a, a great humanitarian, a caregiver. She was a registered nurse. Um, she uh, was very, very much um, on uh, equal rights for everyone. Um, she was a nurse in the, in the Deep South, and she cared for people of all races equally. Um, she worked 24-7. Uh, president Carter was the first president to be born in a hospital. And, and this was only because his mother worked 24-7. She went into labor at the hospital in Plains, the Wise Sanitarium, which was actually a very famous hospital in its time. Um, and she went into labor while she was working there and gave birth to the uh, future president, future 39th president of the United States. Again, little would anybody know she was making history that day. But with her working 24-7, President Carter was pretty much raised by an African-American woman by the name of Rachel Clark. And um, again, she had a big influence on, on President Carter's life. She, uh, he stayed there. He slept on a dirt floor in their, in their home in front of the fireplace. Uh, she taught him how to fish. She taught him right from wrong. Um, she taught him all the things that kids need to know when they're growing up. Uh, he, she was uh, pretty much his second mother and, and, and mostly raised him. The other lady that had a huge influence in his life was a lady by the name of Julia Coleman. And she was President Carter's school teacher. And she was a remarkable teacher. Uh, way ahead of her time, she taught her students to um, that there were things outside of the little rural town of Plains uh, she taught him world history, and she would say to her class that, um, you know, study hard, do your homework, and listen up, because one of you could end up being president of the United States. And actually, I, I mentioned that at a presentation when President Carter was in the front row of the audience, and he raised his hand, and he corrected me on that and said, well, she actually said one of you boys could be president of the United States, because it was a sign of the time. Uh, you know, wasn't thought of back then that a woman would, would be president of the United States. But um, he had influence from his uncle, uh, Jack, who was a favorite uncle of his, who was in the Navy. That's precisely why President Carter went to Annapolis, making him the only president to graduate from Annapolis. Um, and, uh, and he had fully intended on having a career in the Navy. One little known story about him that a lot of people don't know is when he was in the Navy uh, as a new sailor and he was on the deck of a ship uh, in a bad storm, a wave actually came, he was standing watch, a wave actually came and swept him off of the ship out, out to sea, and as luck would have it, the next one swept him right back on deck and he was able to grab onto something and, and hold on. Um, Admiral Rickover, who he uh, he served for a very, very tough admiral, very difficult to work under. Uh, he worked in the nuclear submarine program under Admiral Rickover, and that inspired President Carter to write the book, his first book, um, Why Not Why Not Your Best, or Why Not the Best. Um, and that was because President Rickover had called him into his office and asked him if he'd done his best on a task, and uh, President Carter uh, just had to tell the honest answer and say no that you know he hadn't, um, and it inspired his book that he put out just prior to prior to the election. Um, one of my most uh, treasured items is this here, and I, I know I'm getting a little short on time, so I'm going to hurry it up. But um, this is actually. Uh, the invitation program, not the invitation, but the program that President Carter and Mrs. Carter got when they attended President Obama's inauguration. And President and Mrs. Carter gave it to my wife and I because they felt that we uh, would like it for our collection. And uh, inside, of course, President Carter has signed it. And shortly after he gave me this, I had the opportunity to meet President Obama, and President Obama signed it. Uh, for me as well. So this is really a, a, 
a special gift from the Carters to my wife and I, who I will always, always cherish it. And um, I have a picture of President Carter here actually signing that in, in my office. He's standing right about where I'm sitting right now. Uh, and uh, when he, he stayed at our house uh, a few years back. Um, I'm going to close with uh, one of my favorite stories with uh, about President Carter that he he told me himself. Um, actually, actually, before I tell this last one to close with, I'll tell another quick one uh, because he told me this one as well, and it's very touching. He was very very good friends with President Ford. Um, they became very very close friends, and um, they. Uh, after their presidencies, and he told me that one day Gerald Ford called him, and he said, "Jimmy, I have a, a favor to ask you." And President Carter said, "Sure, Jerry, you know anything." And he said, "Well, I would like you to give the eulogy at my funeral." And President Carter told me that he was very taken taken back by that and didn't know what to say at first. And he said, finally, he said, "Well, Jerry, I'll make a deal with you." I'll give the eulogy at you, your funeral if you'll promise to give the eulogy at my funeral. And of course, uh, President Carter did give the eulogy at, at President Ford's funeral, and Mrs. Carter did the same for Betty Ford at her funeral. Um, this is a, and this is my final story for the night, and we'll close with this one, but this is a book signed by President Carter that's all about the intelligence that he had done on uh, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin prior to the uh, Mideast uh, peace agreement that was held at Camp David. And the story that President Carter told me is the story of how the deal really got done. Uh, the, the, when they were there at Camp David, the uh, negotiations were, were not going very well. And it got to the point where Sadat went to his cabin and Begin went to his. They couldn't even be in the same room without really arguing and screaming at each other. So President Carter took it upon himself to go from cabin to cabin, trying to convince both of them to, uh, to stay and, and make a deal. And uh, when he finally went to Begin's cabin after several times, he got there and Begin was uh, actually packing his bags. And he said, Mr. President, it's over. There, there will be no deal. Um, I'm leaving. And President Carter tried to convince him. He couldn't convince him. And he had kind of resigned himself to the fact that maybe they were not going to get a peace agreement done. And just as he was getting ready to leave, the Prime Minister Begin asked President Carter for a favor. And he said, I would, my grandchildren love you, and they would like to get a signed picture from you. And so President Carter said, certainly, that would be no problem. Well, due to all the intelligence that he had done on uh, the two, he knew all of, of uh, Prime Minister uh, Begin's grandchildren's names. So he went back to his Camp David office. Got, got pictures, I think there were three or four grandchildren. He knew all their names, he put their names on each one, and he signed each one, love Jimmy Carter. He took the pictures back to Prime Minister Begin's uh, cabin, knocked on the door, Begin answered the door himself. He was kind of in a huff, um, getting ready to leave, and President Carter said he just kind of abruptly took the pictures from President Carter and said, thank you. And <clears throat> President Carter said that he looked down, Begin looked down at the pictures and noticed that the first one was personalized to his grandchild. He went to the second one, noticed the same thing, and then that they said, love Jimmy Carter on it. Went to the third one, saw the same thing. And tears started to come down the prime minister's cheeks. And he looked up at President Carter and he said, Mr. President, we need to try again. And that's how the Mideast Peace Agreement got done. So I thank you for listening tonight. Uh, I have a whole lot more memorabilia I'd love to show you, but I know we need to have some time for uh, questions. 
And so uh, I'd like to uh, refer back to Jerry, and uh, if I can answer some questions for you, I would be glad to. And again, thank you so much for being here tonight. Well, thank you, Dr. Cook. I mean, just an outstanding presentation. And we do have a few quick questions I want to ask, and then I'll go ahead and, and we'll close the program up. Um, Victor was asking, he says, do you know when the, the Secret Service began protecting the presidents? Um, yeah, that's a good question, uh, Victor, because it didn't come along, um, it didn't just all of a sudden come along instantly. Um, that's something that always amazes me in, in presidential history that after, um, you know, the assassinations that, that did occur, uh, you know, with, with President Lincoln, of course, and then and, uh, Garfield and McKinley, that they really didn't get on it uh, that, that quick. Um, ironically, the, uh, the bill to create the Secret Service was one of the last things that President Lincoln signed. Uh, and before his assassination. But the Secret Service was created for uh, more for going after counterfeiters than presidential uh, protection. So um, it just kind of after that, just kind of came around gradually, but you really didn't see it until after uh, William McKinley's assassination. And probably, uh, I would say Teddy Roosevelt was probably the first one that you actually saw it come, uh, you know, be kind of on a regular basis. And actually, um, uh, Teddy had a cabin that was out in the woods, a little retreat, and his wife Edith would uh, secretly have a Secret Service agent stand guard out in the woods uh, without Teddy knowing, because Teddy wouldn't have allowed it uh, had he known about it. So it really kind of started with Teddy Roosevelt as far as presidential protection. Very good. And then Karen is asking, uh, and I think this pertains to uh, uh, Grover Cleveland, how did that affect his life after the operation, his speech, his eating, general health, et cetera, like that? You know, surprisingly, it didn't. Um, no one really ever noticed it. The prosthesis was so, so well done. Um, I think they changed the prosthesis out one time, if I'm not mistaken. It could have been twice, but I think it was only changed out one time. Uh, because, of course, when they first put it in, and then there would be swelling and all that from the surgery. Uh, but it never really uh, affected uh, his speech uh, or, uh, or anything. And most people, even to this day, most people really don't realize that he had that extensive operation. I see. Okay. And then, Ed, uh, this will be the last question. Uh, Ed is asking, how long did Frances live, and was she active in politics? Um, well, uh, I... I I don't know the exact date that Francis um, that Francis lived to. It's not coming to me right now. Uh, but she 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 did remarry. Um, she was the first uh, first lady uh, widowed first lady to remarry. Um, she did, and um, she was not interested in being in politics at all. Um, so she she really kind of kind of laid low on the issues, um, but I'm sorry, I don't know the exact date that she, that she passed away. Um, I really don't know. Okay, well, very good. Well, Dr. Cook, thank you so much for your presentation. We get through COVID-19, we're going to have to have you back live at, uh, in, in West Branch at the Hoover Presidential Library Museum. So. Oh, thank you. I, I, would, I would love that. I have not been there, and I was looking so forward to coming uh, and was so disappointed, of course, as, as everybody has been disappointed over one thing or another. But it was one of my great disappointments that I wasn't able to be there in person. But I, I do thank you for having me on this Zoom presentation. Uh, it, it's been great. It was a lot of fun. And uh, thank you for the invitation to come out next year. I, I, I uh, would really, really love that. As I mentioned, I speak on all of the presidents. So we can uh, talk on any, any other ones you want or any of the same ones that I can bring a whole bunch of other uh, memorabilia with me. Thank you, Jerry. Well, it looks, looks, it looks like you won't run out of any, so uh, we hope we can get you back sooner rather than later. So thank you very, very, very much, Dr. Cook. So thank you. I've got for, thank you. For, very good. And I've got for uh, just a couple of announcements. One is uh, uh, somebody was asking about uh, uh, the, the Hoover blogs, and uh, you can go to, uh, just Google Hoover Heads, and it's on the Presidential uh, Library Museum site, uh, and they have, uh, you can actually subscribe to the Hoover Heads, they come out once a week, and they're just great stories 
uh, that really tells you a lot about uh, Herbert and Lou Henry Hoover. Uh, we've got a couple uh, programs I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware of coming up. Um, we had scheduled uh, August 10th, uh, which was Herbert Hoover's birthday, a celebration of life and lives, and Alan Hoover III, uh, the president's great-grandson, was going to speak on that. And of course, unfortunately, everybody in Iowa knows we had the uh, uh, Derrico, the storm come through, and we uh, had to postpone it. It has been rescheduled for uh, Thursday, September 10th, and it'll be from seven to eight o'clock, and Alan Hoover uh, III will be the speaker, and he's got some special stories about his great granddad that uh, he's gonna love to tell. And then our third Thursday program for September is uh, on women's suffrage, and the speaker is Karen Kadrowski, and uh, the, basically the 2020 marks the centennial of ratification of the 19th Amendment, and this program will discuss the history of the suffrage movement, including its controversy, uh, controversial items, Iowans' roles, and its impact. And of course, advanced registration is required, and we would just love to have you register. Um, it's very easy. Uh, you can always go to our hooperpresidentialfoundation.org website, or of course, pick it up on social media, or from your favorite uh, public library. Again, thank you so much for uh, uh, joining us tonight, and we look forward to seeing you soon. Thank you.